This is my bot. Say hi, bot. It's playing this copy of Pokemon Fire Red for me. And it's designed to help me solve a very specific problem that people who push Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green to their absolute limit have. You see, most people who play these games don't play them that differently from when they were younger. Play the story, beat the gyms, collect some friends, and maybe look for a shiny or two along the way. And there's nothing wrong with that. I still play them this way too. But sometimes I just need more. You see, recently I moved near one of my good friends, Papa Hepe, and we have been doing a lot of battles in Generation 3 in real life. And when we do those battles, I like to have the best Pokémon available to me. This doesn't just mean the conventionally strongest Pokémon, like powerful legendaries, but it also means that their hidden stats in the game's code are at the highest possible value. Getting these stats to be good is normally a thing of chance. Each one, known as an individual value, can be a number as low as 0 and as high as 31. And it's possible for every single one of the six stats to be the peak value of 31 at the same time. But the odds of you finding a Pokemon like that are, well, astronomically low. Using probability, we can calculate that getting all perfect stats is about a 1 in a billion chance. And this doesn't include randomized nature, which also affects the stats. Obviously, it's impossible to get a Pokemon like that then, right? Well, it would be if I didn't have my hidden Jutsu, Random Number Generator Manipulation. This technique lets me control the game to my will, all without hacking, modding, or glitching. And on top of that, it's very fun. It turns breeding or catching a perfect Pokemon from a game of patience, where if you put enough time into it, you'll get lucky, to a game of skill, where if you have good enough reaction time and game knowledge, you can get the Pokemon that you want on the first try, with perfect stats and shiny. So what's the problem then? It seems like using this technique, I can solve any problem I would have here, no? Well. The problem lies with the solution, and to understand it, we have to understand how RNG seeding works in Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green. The random number generator is meant to look random, but it's really not. In fact, it's actually called a pseudo-random number generator. And just like pseudo-wudo, it's a pretender. This is why we can control or predict it. Generally, the way PRNG works in Pokemon is that the game starts up, and then it needs to start to look random. So it pulls a number from somewhere, which is typically the current date and time. And then it does some math to it. In Gen 3, it multiplies this number by 1,103,515,245. And then it adds 24,691 to it. And that's your new seed. And it does this process every 16 milliseconds. That's 1 60th of a second. We call this 16 millisecond window a frame, or an advancement in the RNG manipulation community. The game is doing this because it does everything in 16 millisecond windows. It might not seem like it, but in one frame, the game does its entire operation. Every piece of visual, audio, game code, all for that one frame, is done in 16 milliseconds. That's what we're working with as RNG manipulators. All of this so far might seem fine, but if you know anything about Fire Red and Leaf Green, you might have caught on to the source of our problem. And that's that there is no date and time in Fire Red and Leaf Green. So what do these games use to start the randomization then? Well, it's a feature of the GBA CPU called the Timer 1 Register. When it's turned on, which Fire Red does on boot, the Timer 1 rapidly counts up from 0 to a cap of 65,535, where it can then overflow back to 0 and repeat the counting. Then, at the title screen, when you push A, L, or Start to advance past it, Fire Red pulls whatever value is in the Timer 1 and uses that as the initial seed. And when I say the Timer 1 advances rapidly, I mean it. You thought the PRNG timer moved fast, incrementing once every 16 milliseconds? Well, that's nothing compared to the GBA's CPU. It runs at 16.78 megahertz. This means in 16 milliseconds, it can do up to 625,000 cycles. In this speed, this register is the root of the problem. This means, unless what the game does in its 16 millisecond window takes the exact same amount of time every single time, from the moment you start the game until the moment that you press continue on the title screen, the value you get from the timer 1 will be wildly different. One frame can cause 15,000 timer 1 increments, or it can cause 20,000, depending on how many CPU cycles that game loop used. It cannot be predicted by doing some calculations or math. When we first started doing RNG manips in these games, this seemed random and impossible to control with any degree of precision. But 
If you're clever, you will notice that the solution to our problem actually lies within the problem itself. You see, the CPU cycles aren't going to be the same unless the game is doing the exact same thing every frame until you load the game. But what can you do that is the same thing? Nothing. We just turn the game on and wait, and using a timer, we press A on a specific game frame. And if we do this exactly down to the 1 60th of a second, we will get the same result for the timer one every single time. This was verified by testing things out in the best GBA emulator out there, MGBA. I load up Fire Red, and I wait a specific amount of advancements on the title screen. I pause the game and make a save state. Then I look at the value in RAM Viewer, and I continue. And then I repeat it, and I make sure it's the same. And I do this a couple times just to make sure that I'm definitely getting the same seat every time. Once it was confirmed, I tried to hit the value on a real console, and I never could. It turns out, despite being the best, MGBA is not good enough for what I needed. It does not emulate the GBA's CPU with 100% exact precision, which is to be expected, by the way. Most emulators ever made do not need or have this type of precision. But what am I going to do? I guess I could aim for the same timer every single time, hoping I'd hit the same seed that I recorded, but RNG Minips are all about options, and the more limited our starting points are, the more limited our options for catching the Pokemon that we want are. For a while, we kind of did things like this. We would aim for a specific timer, and because of human imprecision, we would hit a couple of different seeds, and we would try to aim for those seed clusters. But that was kind of a clunky way of doing things, and it made RNG Minipping more about luck than skill, which defeats the whole purpose. But what am I to do? I can't manually press A one frame at a time until the intro finishes and loops on itself. Even if I could, that would take years and I would have no guarantee of my accuracy. I could be missing seeds, hitting the same one multiple times, or just writing them down wrong. Plain old human error. And this is where our little robot comes in. My friend Xiao and I designed it to be able to do exactly what I just described. Wait, press A on the title screen after an exact amount of frames, get the seed, reset, wait exactly one more frame, Repeat until all initial seeds are collected. But how does the bot work, and how did I come to know how to create it? Well, it's all thanks to one of my favorite games ever, Super Smash Bros. Melee from the Nintendo GameCube. I've competed at and been a tournament organizer for Melee for many years. And in 2014-2015, because I did not take care of myself, I started to have tendonitis in my forearms. This was from playing too many video games and being a baker, where I constantly had to use my forearms to shape dough or play the games, and I wasn't stretching or accounting for my posture or hand grip. It was my fault I hurt myself, not the game or my job, let's be clear. But it meant I couldn't play Melee anymore without feeling serious pain, and this was devastating to me. A lot of my social circle at the time was through this game, and if I wasn't competing or practicing with them, I was kind of just isolating myself. There was a light at the end of the tunnel, however. A new ergonomic, not at all cheater controller known as the Smashbox was being developed by Hitbox. It promised to help those with hand pain, but it was a few years out and kind of expensive. And shortly after it was announced, Reddit user Simple Controllers posted a guide on how to make your own Smashbox by disassembling a GameCube controller and attaching it to an Arduino. And I did. Here's the Blissy Box. Made of plexiglass, an old wine crate, a lot of wires, and very, very bad soldering. This box is how we'll be controlling the Game Boy Advanced. It uses the Nico Hood Nintendo Arduino Code Library, which, yes, lets you control the GameCube controller via button presses, but Arduino controllers can be pressed digitally as well via a code command, which means we can code it to be fully automated. And while, yes, this is for the Nintendo GameCube, the Arduino can be used to control a GBA by use of the Game Boy Player Peripheral for the GameCube. So, I bought a second Arduino and assembled it the same way as my box controller, but without all the Sanwa Switch wiring. This is a huge pain, by the way, because the GameCube controller has very teeny tiny fragile wires that are easy to damage. So, rather than strip the teeny tiny wires, I desolder the cable from the top of the GameCube motherboard. Then, you have to connect them to this 3 to 5 volt bidirectional converter and connect that to the Arduino. And if all goes well, everything will light up without the GameCube shorting and turning off. And it only cost me one GameCube controller. If you want to see exactly how I assembled it, you can read Simple Controller's document, which I will link in the description. It's a great tutorial, although I would say if you're building a controller, just use OpenBox instead. It's kind of better and easier to assemble these days. 
I only did things this way because I was familiar with it and because of how customizable the Arduino that I purchased is. Code-wise, my friend Xiao wrote everything for the bot in the Arduino. We needed everything to be as precise as possible, so I didn't want to screw anything up. The idea is that the bot is running its inputs about as twice as fast as the speed of the GBA, so we can get what is called half-frame precision to catch any edge cases and confirm we're not missing any seats. The only thing I have to do is type out the inputs manually here, where I specify which buttons are pressed and for how long, and then I upload the code to the Arduino. The only thing left is to devise a method to actually record the seeds, which is easier said than done. The first issue when it comes to recording seeds is that, well, the game does not display the seed anywhere. It's a hidden value, just like Ivy's from earlier. This means we have to find some way to display the seed. And typically while doing RNG manips, we could find this out by calculating the stats of the Pokemon that we caught. This would be quite cumbersome for what we are doing here though. Our first draft on this was using glitches using arbitrary code execution, which is a glitch that kind of allows you to do anything, Xiao made it so that using this very normal move, our trainer ID would become the initial seat. Then I'd set up a capture card on an old computer for my GameCube and use some Python image recognition libraries to capture the trainer card and convert the image to a string of numbers. This worked okay, but we had a few problems. First was that the image recognition was not easy to get working. It did not help that the Game Boy Player disc does not produce the best image quality. Second, the glitch move we used to trigger Ace had a variable animation length, which isn't predictable. This meant that I had to make the bot assume the glitch move took the longest amount of time that it could take, which is like 10 seconds of waiting, which wastes a lot of time. And finally, for some reason we were never able to fully figure out, the game would randomly soft reset sometimes while using the glitch move. So, in my Python image recognition software, we had to write some code that would compensate if the game took too long to find the image that it would take a screenshot of. It was a whole process and kind of a pain. And we're gonna have to go back and recollect those seeds later after our main batch is done. Then, I kind of had an epiphany one day. We could ditch all of this difficult to handle image recognition stuff simply by using the Nintendo e-reader. You see, over the last year, I've made several different DLCs for Pokemon Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald by using the Nintendo e-reader, where I code some custom events into the game using the game scripting language and GBA thumb assembly. Now, Fire Red and Leaf Green were and still are out of scope, but I can get code into them in a very, very hacky way. If I just open the spot where the e-reader would send data to in Fire Red in MGBA's RAM viewer, I can literally paste whatever I want in there. And if I do it right, the code will work. So I wrote code the way I normally would, compiled it for the e-reader, sent it to my emerald, and then copied and pasted it into Fire Red. Surprisingly, this works like a charm. The code I wrote is simple and relies on the discoveries I made for my most recent e-cards. What I'll be doing is accessing Fire Red's flash chip directly and writing to one of the unused sectors. This is where the game stores your actual save file when it's turned off. It works similarly to a USB thumb drive. I wrote some code that writes down where the seed is supposed to be stored, stores the seed, and increments the storage location by two bytes because that's how big a seed is. Then the NPC that I'm speaking to tells me what seed I got, how many seeds I recorded, and if the saving worked. That's it. I don't even need to click save because I'm accessing the flash chip directly through some of the game's functions. Then when I collect 2000 seeds, which is about the save size of the unused save sector, I open the save file in a hex editor and all of my seeds are there for the taking. Channel member 10Ben, who is helping me with this project by farming seeds for Leaf Green, wrote a Python script to extract them quickly to a text document. Using this method, we have collected thousands of seeds for Fire Red, with more to come. The best part about this is that all of these seeds are shareable. So if you own an English copy of Fire Red or Leaf Green, you can use the seeds that Ben and I are farming. This allows an unparalleled amount of control over what initial seed we want to hit and what Pokemon that we could find in these games. It's both good for stats and for shinies. The bot still has to find several thousand more seeds and run some error correction on previously acquired ones. And once it's done for Fire Red in English, I'll move on to some other languages. If you want to see it messing about in real time, I've actually set up a YouTube channel for the bot to run 24 seven. You can check it out here. I hope you guys enjoy this video. I know it's a little bit different than stuff that I normally do, but I hope to see you doing some Fire Red and Leaf Green RNG manips using the seeds that I farm. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you next time.